Oh, look at that. You got a, a like a microphone set up like Lemmy for Motorhead. Yes, I am the ace of spades, and I live in a shitty apartment. <laughs> you knew he lived in a shitty apartment, do you? Yes. Uh, as rumor has it, uh, from some folks who were in signed bands as well, not as legendary as Lemmy, he lived in the same shitty apartment in the mid 2000s that he was living in back in the 90s back in the 80s like in the valley and he probably di- he probably died <laughs> with that apartment too i think he right. still lived at the same one that's crazy right <laughs> it's such a weird piece of trivia that i'll never forget <laughs> what a yeah and what a wild thing you know like he's like fuck it this is you know it's good enough i he's on the road all the time so i could sort of see it he he was a road dog I can't help but feel like I relate to that living style. As much as I would love to live better, I pass by houses in nicer neighborhoods and feel like, man, that would be nice. But at the same time, I crawl back in my little mouse hole. I'm like, this is all right. I think of that song Motor Breath by Metallica. Motor Breath, it's all about touring. Motor Breath. And, and that's like, a, I think that song might have been influenced by motor or by Motorhead. But that lifestyle is pretty cool. Pretty cool. <laughs> I've done some tours and it's it's pretty uh it's like jumping out of a plane or something. It's pretty exciting. I would like to keep doing it till I can't walk, actually. <laughs> Does my mic sound good? It sounds excellent. Does it sound hot? <laughs> no, it sounds fine. Okay, good. What does a hot mic mean? I don't know. Hot mic means that it's very sensitive. Are we are we gonna start recording now? Yes, we are and already we... I just oh. started recording when when you called. That's good. I should know this by now. I, I'm going to quit asking. This is a, probably the official last time. And then we'll have a conversation about secret occult writings after the show when you turn off the record. Exactly. Good. Okay. Yes. I didn't want to give any secrets away. No. Good. <laughs> This podcast is based around the history and experiences of the infamous Shane Bugby, recollected and retold by Shane Bugby himself. Who is Shane? Well, you're about to find out. I'm your host, Nanarol, and this is Speak of the Devil. Alrighty, so for today's episode, we have a little bit of a turducken of an episode, the turkey being the big one. Um, I would like to know today more about what you knew about Dorothea Puente, your collaborations with her, as well as perhaps the friendship you had, what you learned about her as a person, and we're going to draw some connections with that to some other serial killers you spoke to. Um, We know that you have been of notoriety, excuse me, I can't talk today. You've had this notoriety of being the one who had a piece of Ed Gein's gravestone, but also I've heard rumor that you spoke to Richard Ramirez as well. And perhaps there's some others but these three after we speak a little bit of them I have a little bit of a connection I wanted to draw out of those three it's a very odd balance of a trinity that I found when wow. looking up this stuff I I'm love thinking it about it yeah I can't wait to say you see there's also Gacy which coming from Chicago he's 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 a big deal here and I think he's a big deal in serial killer culture because of all the art he did but yeah, I worked with I worked directly with John Wayne Gacy. But but that's neither here nor there. I, you know, I mean, I'm going with your flow. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And let's go ahead and tag that onto our docket for today as well. I think that that would be really great to tag that onto there as you're sipping a cup of something in a mug that says "Be nice to you," which that's I right. think a lot of these a lot of these bad guys, a lot of these lone wolves, these outcasts. Probably should have had a cup that said that. Had they had a woke face brush them in life, perhaps they would have been kinder to themselves. Yes, this is a woke face mug. Oh, how beautiful. (laughs) 
actually that makes me think of a uh, weird change of subject but um i saw an old picture from either 60s or 70s of von dutch and he had like this like plastic eyeball glued on his yeah. forehead and it it makes me think of that a little bit all righty back to topic um <laughs> You say about being nice to you, and when I was looking up Dorothea Puente, I saw that she had a really hard, hard childhood, but then she had this string of, like, failed marriages, she lost her children, she gave up her children to adoption, she just had some hard knocks, and I think that being nice to herself came in the package of the string of murders she had. And she kind of did what she had to do to survive. She didn't really have any emotional attachment, I don't think, to those murders. Perhaps maybe punishing the men who hurt her through those victims. But her means of survival, I think, were her way of being nice to her. What do you think? Oh, that's a great... Um, that's a great... Uh, outlook... Uh, uh, um... How do you say perspective? Perspective okay. <laughs> is, the word, is the word I'm looking for. Um, that's a great perspective. I haven't heard that before ever. Um, I think the I think with the Me Too movement, a lot of that stuff becomes more clear to a person like myself. What you're you know like be, because I think she experienced life in a hard way that only women understand truly. You know, when you think about her history of multiple husbands, she took on a, a lot of abuse. I know this from talking to her, from her husbands and spouses and partners in crime. And so I, I think, I think what you're saying is true. I, I, I don't think she had malice towards any of the victims. Yet I think she had a sadistic streak to hurt men in general. Yes, like almost because like her own form of therapy. Yeah, she's yeah, she's she she got off on it. She she liked what she was doing or she wouldn't have kept doing it, you know. She liked what she was doing. But I don't think I think she, she her excuse and I think she believed this was that she was doing them a favor. They were sick, they were so she just overmedicated them. So she was doing everyone a favor. She was able to keep her boarding house open because she'd collect their checks when she murdered them. And it, it, she would pretend they were still alive and their checks would come in and she would cash them. And so, so when they were dead, they, were, they weren't reported dead yet because no, she's she, clearly collecting Social Security still. Right. She's hiding their bodies in the backyard and throwing them over a bridge and shit like that. So, yeah, it was you're, you're right about being kind to herself. She would she liked to go out to eat. She liked to the finer things. She liked her chocolate. She liked that's That was our deal. When I did the book with her, she's like, I just want you to send me boxes, a commi commissary boxes with like ramen, chocolate, whatever you could send to a prison in a box. And you know, there was, there's a list they give you what the allow in. And so, yeah, I think she enjoyed those, those creature comforts for sure. And that's why, but, but her reasoning was I fed them well, you know, she fed them well, took care of her tenants and when she would say that, I took, I fed them well, and I took care of my tenants. She certainly did take care of them. <laughs> it's almost like her own form of a last meal on death row. Oh my goodness! I love your perspective on this. I am so close to it. I cannot see it that way, but yeah, yeah, it absolutely is. Let me take care of you, fatten you up, and and continue to over medicate you in your meals because that's what you would do. That's what the, that's why I did the cookbook with it because I thought it was sort of humorous. I th when I was talking to her through prison, you know, prison conversation, I just got hungry because she'd like talk about these tamales <laughs> she's making, prison tamales, and I make this great sauce, and I'm like, See, Thea, can you send me some recipes? And she would, and I'm like, you know, we need to do a cookbook with you. And she's like, I was a chef, which you couldn't, you know, Thea was a pro prophetic. She was a, a, a she lied a lot. Oh, so like a pathological liar, perhaps? That, there's the word I was looking for, okay. yes. I'm sorry I'm missing my words, but this is the way it is tonight. I would love to meet a prophetic liar. Just someone yeah, right. who tells me the future, but it's someone else's <laughs> future. So it's kind of a lie, but it's not. It's just not just, true for me. 
I love that I my my slips. You know, that's when I write. I come up with these slips too, like prophetic liar, and I, I I'm like, that's not the word I was looking for. But I'll leave it when I write my my verse or my whatever you call what I write, my word sculptures. Uh, when I put my word sculptures together and I'll do something like that, I'll, I'll my ADD or whatever it is issue <laughs> I have with my head, I, 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 I substitute words. Prophetic liar I'm writing down right now because I'm going to have to keep that one. <laughs> I, I wrote it down just now, too. <laughs> I'm like, that. man, that's a good name for a song. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, you know, so, so Thea, I, you know, like such a twisted story. She would take in homeless people and stuff like that. So she seemed very much like a caring person, but you're right. She, I think she was a, 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 a narcissist in the classic form, a severe, like pathological, like narcissist, if there's such a thing or a covert narcissist, let's say, where they're very dangerous people. And, uh, I think it was all about her. Her, her care was all about her. You're right. What kind of art did she make in prison? Oh, this is great. So much like when I worked with Gacy, I found out he had an assembly line of painters on the, you know, someone would paint the, the all of his pogo paintings. Some would paint the sky. Some guys would paint the trees and he'd trade them off with food and stuff. So Thea, when Thea would send me paint, so she would set, do like, all this different work, jewelry, uh, colored pencil work. And it would basically, she'd make them into cards, fold this eight and a half by 11 into a four way card and do a greeting card on them. And she would start sending them to me. And I started seeing the style, you know, as, as a person who sells artwork and appreciates artwork, I could see the style was dramatically different in, in these cards. Like I'd get 12 of one style, 12, cause we had, you know, I'd, I'd get the cards and I would resell them. And, uh, and, and buy the uh, boxes of food. <clears throat> and so I'd get 12, and then the, the next 12 was a whole different style. The next 12 was a whole different style. And she got so sloppy with what she was doing with me, and, and you know, because she kept just sending me a ton of stuff, that at some point names, and I think this is in the cookbook, I have a scan in the back of it, uh, Cooking with uh, Serial Killers, the cookbook, um, I, think, I, I think I have a scan of this, but she crossed out a name. Someone else signed the cards art and she just crossed it out, covered it up and signed her name on top of it. And I was like, oh, God, this is awesome. Like, like uh, not a prophetic liar, but a lazy liar. <laughs> it's almost anti-comedy, like Andy Kaufman-esque narcissism, where she didn't care about the product, but she was so upset that it wasn't her name right or something like that is what it's sounding like. It's very, it's, it's a train wreck. It sounds it was, like a wonderful train wreck. Yeah, it was someone else's name, another prisoner. So she was getting work, artwork from other prisoners. <laughs> she was trading them their artwork to give to me, and she would just sign the bottom of them. And that's why there was all these different styles. So there's not much that you'll find in the true crime collectibles uh, from Dorothea Puente that is made by her. I, I obtained a few things that were made by her. It's merch. Yeah, it was merch. Exactly. It was merch. And she knew she was not no notorious. And I remember at one point when I'm talking to her and interviewing her, she's like, you know, Shane, I have, I have a quite a notoriety in, in, in the West Coast. And maybe we could do a coffee mug with my face on it. And that, you know, that's that's sort of the combination of the combination of moments that that evolved into this cookbook. You know, she wanted to make a coffee mug with her face on it. I was like, I've never and I've dealt with a lot of serial killers or criminals. I have never had one so honest about wanting their self exploited. At that point, the covert narcissist was like a tadpole and now it's grown legs and it's slowly turning into a frog, <laughs> climbing yeah. out of the sea. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was it. That was, she, she was a trip. She was a trip. So I, yeah. Oh, actually, you know, there's, I don't know if you know this, this about, I don't know if this is on the internet, but she was up for parole and I had my, my lawyer sent the parole board a letter saying she could live with me and she would have a job and all this. And so it was getting up there and she, she got up there and they, the parole board called and asked more questions about the letter. And I was just like, at that point, I got a little, 
a little worried. I'm like, I'm just going to make sure she doesn't get near the food. I was like, about to say, lock those lids. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to lock up the fridge. She'll get her own mini fridge. I'll get her own room. She'll have her own fridge. She's got to stay away from my fridge. And I started thinking about those things. Like, what if she gets she gets honorary? Like, maybe she shouldn't live here. You know, <laughs> Don't ever be in the system for social security, at least artists. <laughs> maybe maybe that kept you would have kept you safe if that had happened. Yeah, but then I worry about the people I was dating at the time because Thea had a Thea, there became a crush, and you know she was writing me love letters oh. and love poems. So and someone so I, else had to hide their lids, maybe. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. You know, so I said start, start. I started to think, well, I got to worry about the people around me. Uh, Thea is a good person to be friends with and not enemies with. There's some people that you might work with, but you may not take them home for Thanksgiving and it's kind of sounds like one of those things maybe you know she sounds like she has really good recipes but maybe if you make them at home by yourself yeah let her you know and, <laughs> that's funny and anytime I would make I'd make her salsa it's like in the cookbook Dorothea's favorite salsa and I, I love it and I would make it for people and if I told them the story of where it came from they would qu get queasy like <laughs> a, a Steve, Steve Dobbs, like, is this going to murder me? Is this going to kill me? And I couldn't believe that people would ask that question. Like, is, is it's this? It's not like this... you put like cyanide in the salsa. Right. I didn't understand where they were coming from. Like, do you think I'm using leaves from a poisonous plant in here and I'm eating it with you? <laughs> like, but there was a real legitimate knee jerk reaction to understanding <laughs> that. Cause I'd bring it to like, like, let's say I'm going to someone's uh, a, a person I'm dating's family function a potluck Christmas dinner, I'll bring it there. And so you're there with a very broad mix of people. And so these people would really trip out when they heard about a serial killer salsa on the table. They're like, oh my God, you know. <laughs> but like, okay, here's a here's a nice counter argument. Food Network and all these other, like cooks.com and all these other places have thousands of recipes. And what are the chances? There's like a one in three chance that the person who made the recipe had diarrhea. Does that gross <laughs> you out? Does that freak you out? Or like there's a likelihood that maybe one in eight people had the clap. Maybe one in ten had like something like didn't wash their hands before they made the initial recipe. You don't know these things about them, but if you knew them, it would weird you out too. But you're not going to be like, oh my God, it's going to kill me when you make it. It's sort well, of right. <laughs> right. When I make their recipe, I'm not weirded out. But, but when you say that like that, I'm like, every instance that you've said, I would be way more weirded out about than a serial killer making a salsa. I, I saw your eyes kind of shift back and forth like you're looking for the diarrhea in your room. Uh, yeah, I was like, fuck <laughs> that. Now that you told me that, take your recipe and go home. <laughs> <laughs> but too much information, buddy, or pal, or, or honey, or young lady, or whatever the phrase is that I, I'm supposed to be saying in, in these days, in this time. Do you think that it might be okay for... A recipe to be shared to the listeners oh yeah i would love to I'd, I'd share one for sure whatever you want all right so in our notes we will have a recipe there for you guys and then you can start a conversation at your next family function all right nan nan I, i'm at nan I'll, I'll ask you okay there's there's two i would think of sharing her favorite rest her favorite salsa or prison tamales it's your call oh man Let's do salsa because everyone okay. loves chips and salsa. True. And not too many people are going to love prison tamales unless they're in prison. Yeah, there's a time and place for them. And I don't know <laughs> if I don't think if Mother's Day brunch is going to be a good time for prison tamales. I wish I had a drum like doom. There's a time and place <laughs> for those. Yeah, that. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, did you try all the recipes that she gave you? Oh, great question. Yes. As a matter of fact, what is the name? Vogue Chocolate. It's a famous chocolate in Chicago, Chocolatier. And it's it's distributed all over the country. You can find it on the West Coast. It's a, like a $10 chocolate bar. And so it's a very high-end chocolate. And this young lady was creating this company, and she was coming in and out of a Kinko's where I was working on this book with a gentleman that worked at Kinko's. 
So I'd go in there and get free computer time and he'd help out and we'd print off mock copies of it and go over it. And, and she was like, what do you work? You know, he was like, he knew her as a chef. She's been to Paris and all, you know, she's a high end chef. And, um, she, she asked what we were working on. We said a cookbook and she's like, well, do all the recipes work? And I'm like, I don't give a fuck. It's a serial killer cookbook. And she's like, I do. Let me take one of those mock copies and I'll make sure all of these make sense. Because I hate when I get a cookbook that doesn't work. And she's like an obsessed Wow, chef. maybe she's right. a covert narcissist. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought, I saw it as an artist or someone like 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 yourself. Like, I don't like this mediocre shit. Or, you know, like, yeah. like passion I saw. I that's, saw passion. That's pretty fascinating that she didn't even give a shit whose cookbook it was. She just wanted, wanted it to be good. Well, she did, but when it came to about and it was ready to be published, I wanted to put her name on it, and she did care then. She's like, no, 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 thank you. Do not put my name on this. <laughs> but she was so, <laughs> she was super neurotic about, like, not neurotic, but, like, meticulous. She was really yes. meticulous about, <laughs> that's really funny. It's like a, um, like a cursed book. It seems like. It's a companion book to like, you know, there's all these no-no books you can't have. And like, you know, we have ones from movies like Necronomicon, for example. And then Dorothea Puente, co Cooking with a Serial Killer is right next to it is just those no-no books. <laughs> Out of everything I've done, certain groups, certain little circles, like let's say the satanic community see me for one thing, or this metalhead community see me for one thing. But with the Dorothea Puente book, that not only did it reach the true crime community and serial killers and stuff like that, but John Waters buys uh, two dozen of my cookbooks every year Wow! To, ha to hand out as Christmas gifts. And so that's one of the largest compliments as an artist I've ever, wow. I have ever received. I mean, Dimebag Daryl would buy stuff for me every Christmas too, which was pretty fucking cool. But, but John Waters as an artist, he's an artist artist. Yeah. He, and so he bought my book, and that book to this day sells, and that book to this day gets attention on uh, Comedy Central. You, the people do skits. The people call me or give me an email saying, "Oh, the stand-up comic just mentioned it at the show." So I hear about it all the time. The cooking with the serial killer. People really enjoy it, and so <laughs> I'm I'm pretty proud of the book. It, it was you know the idea and the book and and why I came about doing that is almost like I got this. I got this uh, gig with Seconds Magazine, an interview magazine. They wanted me to interview serial killers. And they, Richard Ramirez and all this. And I said, I'm not doing it. Everyone does that. I want to do women serial killers. They're cut out of all the serial killer books. They're never mentioned. They're never, they're never given their due. And I think women are way more dangerous. Like, they don't have the guilt bone that men do. They bring life and they take life. Like, in nature, if a woman has a child that's not functioning she's gonna put it out in the woods so life to them is a different deal than to men and so there it's a really really fucking <laughs> close fucking thing with women and so women serial killers women killers they don't have the need to get caught men do and so it's you know that's why thea is an anomaly so i did this on and thea because no one was doing the woman thing at that time i don't know if they still i don't know if they are to this day but that was how i hooked up with thea Female killers are, I feel like they feed their ego by going through the act, whereas male serial killers seem to go, to, seem to feed their ego getting caught. Oh, I love that. They need the, the male, men need the attention, the, the valid validation or something like that, mm -hmm. where the women are, they're getting off on the sadistic, the, the act. The I think sadist. it's a little bit of playing God too, where, you know, the, it's like, Okay. Almost every kid heard this. Every person heard this as a kid. I brought you into this world. I can take you out. Oh, great. Great, <laughs> great, great, great phrase. It's, you know, and then like, you know, look at Greek mythology. You have, you have Demeter, who is the mother of Persephone, and she brings spring. And when Persephone's gone, she turns into winter because she's sad because Persephone is with Hades. So we have Demeter, Persephone, Dorothea Puente. <laughs> the holy trilogy of nature <laughs> the circle of life oh, I, I wish i wish i would have thought of that phrase in some of my interviews like i i, I bring life I, I gave you life i'll take it out I'll take it that's a great phrase old school phrase and i 
that is great. That is exactly what the serial killer, the female serial killer deal is. They don't give a fuck. And, you know, a lot of times it's escorts are killing people. You know, they're they're taking it. They're killing their customers. Um, you know, it's, I, it's I a, think a little bit of uh, I can't help but like crosses my mind to think of like I, Eileen Warnos. Oh, yeah. The one who is killing her Johns. It's it, it's a little of that, too. I think that she she was very damaged by men and she yes. she took care. It was her therapy. I wrote her and she I, I had a prison shirt from her, mm-hmm. one of her shirts from prison. And and I wrote her and told her my trip, like, I want to write about women serial killers. They're not getting enough credit. And she wrote me back and like, finally. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and she was happy about participating in what I was doing at the time because it would get her some calm. You know, she just wanted money. You know, she wanted some money to buy just like Thea. She wanted chocolate bars and cigarettes and shit she could you know, leverage in prison. How did you skirt the law with currency? Like, how did you, you say you paid her, you, you paid Dorothea in a commissary. Has any lawyer or legal out outlet ever caught on to this form of barter? For yes, Andy, Andy Kahn, he's a he's a guy who who is has uh, badgered eBay into making rules against serial killers and he's a victim's advocate. Mm-hmm. Um he he came forward and wrote Thea a letter while asking her a bunch of questions and Thea sent it to me. And he's he's at, I've been he spoke to me. We he likes me and I like him. So we get along on he doesn't like most of the serial killer community, but we get along. Um, I never paid her. I sent her gifts. You know, we were friends and I sent her gifts. But it was a, you know, I'm, I'm an underground guy and I speak criminal. So we, we go with an unspoken, a lot of times it's unspoken. I just watched this movie, The Irishman, and they're talking about how they have the secret speak. Like, oh, you paint, you paint houses, which means you shoot someone in the head in their house and the blood splatters on the wall. You know, so criminals speak in this way. And so Thea would speak in that way to me like, hey, I'm like, will you send me artwork? Her answer was, yes, I will send you a ton of artwork. And then yada, 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 the sky's blue. How you doing today? And she's like, hey, Shane, would if I sent you a list of commissary items, would you would you send me some as a gift? Yes, Thea, I would, because I got the idea. I got what she was. I got what we were doing, but we never had. A business deal. We never spoke a business deal, and I never, you know, like it was unspoken. Sort of, of course, like asking how much the donation or how many roses to an escort. Right. Oh, exactly. How many roses? Exactly. And that's how it was with the end. Like I shorted her on a box once, and and of course the artwork stopped coming. <laughs> you know, so I was like, hey, Thea, I'll catch up on that Stone box. Stone cold I'll... business, bitch. <laughs> right. Oh, she was right, and, and I was like. I'll, how, how can I catch up? I want to send you two boxes, Thea. And she goes, well, you can send one to my friend. They'll send you a re, you know thing. So she got her two boxes, and I got the artwork that she had told me she would send me as a gift. And so that's the way. I mean, I, you know, like with Gacy, it was a trade deal, and it went through his nephew. Um, he got paid. His nephew got paid. You know, we, we did all the business deal on the street, and his nephew would deliver paintings. You know, so it was like... That's how that works out. I see. But yeah, you just speak. I, I'm a, I, I speak criminal, so I can, <laughs> I can speak to my the 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 serial killers. Far different kind of code talker. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, segging into some of these other serial killers, let's talk a little of Gacy. Chronologically, when were you working with Gacy uh, in this timeline, before or after Dorothea? Oh, before, before Gacy uh, was the first and I grew up in Chicago and I would ride my bike up to Gacy's house when they were digging it up and I would hear the cops and the ambulance workers talking as they're bringing the black body bags out and they're like, there was a cut off dick on the mantle and they're talking about uh, homosexual sex, which I'd never heard about before. I'm like a kid, you know, and I've never heard any of these kind of, it was not filtered. That was police talk and firemen talk. So it was unfiltered and it's Chicago is unfiltered already. So imagine that they were just going and there's a kid sitting there, there's kids with their bikes and they're just talking about it. And then I'd read the newspaper articles and they were all 
they were um, sexually ex exciting um, almost. Like they would talk about oral sex in a way that was enticing and they cut out all the horrible things in the newspapers. So I was like, wow, this is wild. And that's where my inquisitive nature went. Part of it, part of it was as growing up, um, people would say like, my own mother said, I'm just glad you didn't grow up to be a serial kills. And that's a quote <laughs> from a video from her. And, and like teachers would say, you're going to grow up to murder, you know, like all this weird stuff. Weird. I, I, Strangely enough, I was told that in middle school. Oh God, that's so awesome. No, now another, another, another thing between us. <laughs> I love this. We got Marilyn Manson and the projection of murder on us. <laughs> um, and so that, that was my start with the Gacy stuff. And I was a kid. But then when he went to prison, oh, fuck, I was both of Gacy's lawyers came to me. I mean, the state's attorney talked to me and Gacy's lawyer came to me. Fuck, I got a wild Gacy stuff. A lot of stories. Guns were pulled on me because of Gacy. Holy shit. When I think about when you bring up Gacy, I'm almost getting like a trauma of stories rushing my to my head. Yeah. Like, um, so what? then later. But why like, were guns pulled on you? Oh, well, I'm going to finish answering oh, the question. Okay, yeah. okay. Um, so, so later on, I got a gig. I was working at the Underground uh, Comics Hall of Fame, and this gentleman that was running it um, was a savvy businessman. I told him about Gacy, and he said, let's start selling those paintings. They'll sell. So he got in contact with Gacy, made all these deals happen, and I would sell the paintings. And that was uh, a great time, I have to admit. Uh, but I, I would sit there and look at the painting I had on the wall, and I was like, why do I have this here? Why is it incredible to me? Because it's not that he's a murderer. And I figured out it wasn't because he was a murderer or, or, or prolific murderer. It was because the state let him paint that and give it to me. And so it was like this monument to murder. I was like, wow, the, the prison system is letting him do this? So that was the weird, that was the, my expression when I sold those paintings was anti-establishment, anti-system. Anti and so going into the story about getting one of the times about uh, being threatened, person came into the gallery I was running, and I, I'd do a lot of interviews at the time about Gacy, because we had an 800 number we set up where get, you'd call and pay five bucks a minute to talk to get, to talk and hear Gacy tell stories. And so we were really marketing it, really exploiting our relationship. And... Um, this guy came in and asked me a bunch of questions about the Gacy painting. He started to sweat and get upset. And I'm like, you know, you look upset about this. He's like, yeah, I'm sort of, I don't, I don't know if I, I can go with people exploiting this. And I, I explained to him how I saw it with, I see, you know, the state prison are the people who are letting me have this. You know, they could stop that. So my outlook is that I put this forward to show people that that's what's happening. They let this happen. And it's it's not it's not kind to the victims. I agree, you know, and I do. I mean, I, I'm sympathetic with that. But at the same time, if if I get my hand on, hands on something, uh, you know, I, I live in a capitalist society. This is the way it goes. You, you, mm -hmm. you know, I have to exploit what what I have. I have my hands on. I don't have the privilege to walk away from opportunities. Um, very much the reason I can speak criminal. <laughs> um, and so. This gentleman is talking to me, and I make sense to him. He says, you make sense to me. I'll let you know something. My brother was killed by Gacy, and I came in here to shoot you. And he lifts up his shirt, and he had a gun under it. And I was like, well, I'm glad you didn't shoot me. He goes, I go, are you going to go after the state's attorney? He goes, I'm thinking of going after that prison. That's for sure. They're the, you're right. They're the right people to complain to. Because I said, if you complain to the prison and stop these from getting out, how can I sell them? How could anyone have these? So to me, it's remarkable that Gacy, it's not that he can paint, because I, I don't mind him painting in prison. It's the idea that he can send these out <laughs> and, and that victims' families, like he, and, and Gacy told me on the phone, he masturbated to all these paintings, like that what's got him off. He would like just relive his crimes and would jerk off when he would paint a painting or sell it to someone. He really enjoyed it. To be fair, I think a lot of artists jerk off having to do with their art at some point. So I have on, never. On one side, I have never. On one side, I think about how um, the when we were talking earlier about people getting creeped out about the salsa, and I get a little creeped out thinking about the artwork. But again, 
it's kind of that thing again the salsa was puente's artwork <laughs> and here here gacy is with his art it's interesting that um until you mentioned who pulled a gun on you i actually didn't even think about how the victims' families would feel about this artwork getting released. I feel, I actually feel kind of bad that I didn't even think about that until you mentioned that. Oh, I thought about it because I'm in Chicago where all of his victims are from. So <laughs> I understood the, the I, and I, as a Chicagoan, I understand there's, it's, we're not a bullshit culture. You got consequences for your actions here. So I understood there could be consequences within the city yes. and our, and our belief system here. And, uh, it, I'm, that came to fruit a couple times. People would come and threaten me, but they listened to me and I made sense. So they did not hurt me. But that's good. They listened. On one side, I I kind of understand their anger. I yep. don't justify the, I don't see it justifiable to hold a gun to someone. But at the same time, that level of anger, I can't relate to that. So, you know, who am I to say that to? But that's that's really good that you heard them out. And I think that in reality, they just wanted to, their side to be heard. Yeah, they wanted to understand what I was doing, and and I I was able to tell them in an honest way, like you you know there was I have I have, you know we have a bullshit detector in Chicago that's mighty. If they thought I was bullshit, them they would have called me. Um, I'm honestly I'm being honest. When I started selling those paintings, when I looked at the one and tried to figure out because I have to like things to sell them, I have to fall in love with the concept of something, and um, and I, then I can really sell it. And that was the concept for me was, boy, this, the, the cops, the cops are letting this fucking thing out. And Gacy's jerking off to these people and, and hurting their feelings. Man, fuck the cops. Fuck the cops. You know, so that's what I was like putting it out there. Like, fuck the man. Fuck the system. Burn the buildings. You know, I'm a young man at the time. I don't right. agree with this shit anymore, but I was young and angry and um, didn't understand the consequence of war real life consequence. And, um, and so that's where I was coming from. So when I told these people, they, they understood me and they believed me cause it's fucking true. <laughs> you know, Oh, I'll tell you, I got a good story that no one really knows. All right. Know. Um, so Gacy at the end when he was going to, he was up for death and they're like, Oh, all of the appeals have been denied. He's going to death in the lecture chair and now i got to sit with the state's attorney and his lawyer which is another great story but so all of his pro all that was denied and then all of a sudden the paintings are selling we were selling them for a couple hundred bucks a piece a couple years before this then they're going thousand five thousand ten thousand people are just knocking down our door to buy them and um we're selling so many of them but then the real deep collectors the rich people they wanted to protect they were like listen we need to protect our investment. If you're selling this, you're selling so many paintings, they found out about Gacy's assembly line. Because they're like, how many could he paint? Well, he could paint as many as he needed to paint. He had a fucking death row. So everyone on death row worked for Gacy. And so when they found out, when that secret slipped out, the people that were, the collectors that were paying five grand, 10 grand a piece for these paintings were coming to us and complaining. So I came up with this marketing deal. I said, hey, how about this? How about we get one of you to... Uh, how about we get one of you to donate your paintings, donate some of these paintings to a burning. Like we're going to collect paintings and burn them because you should be ashamed to have these paintings. And let's try to do something like that. A book burning, like let's get the, let's get the people to move with shame and feel shame and feel guilt and feel the victim's pain. And, and then they'll give us their paintings back and we'll burn them. And then Deception your investment ritual. stands. Right. But then your, your, your investment stands because you're not giving us your paintings to burn. We're going to get the, the, the crowd, the people who bought these paintings yes. at a, in a whim to give us them back in a whim. Because most people didn't buy them for an investment like these big. No, they big... just got it for a cheap thrill. They, they were excited for a piece of merch. Right. So we did that. And the book we did with Gacy, we made sure to prominently burn. Like when the A and E and all the cameras were there, that was the first thing that we we showed the book to everyone to get a free plug for our book. <laughs> so it was a I don't know dastardly marketing, but but you got to do what you got to do sometimes. And uh, 
the paintings burned and a lot of paintings were given to us. And it was great because, well, it wasn't great, but some old ladies that Gacy would correspond with would turn in their paintings and were like, holy fuck, I never saw this one. This one doesn't get burned. You know, we'd put it to the side, you know, so we were able to filter through the donations and understand, oh, that's a, that's a, that's an assembly line one burn it. This is, holy shit, this is real. He painted this with love, you know. Jerked off with love. Yeah, jerked off with love. <laughs> <laughs> So later on, okay, so the newspapers in Chicago would do stories about me about the Gacy stuff, and the state's attorney that put Gacy to death contacted me, and he wanted to meet. And I recorded this, and that interview is somewhere on archive.org. Um, but he, he sat down with me, and he goes, I have some stuff I want to sell you. Come to meet with me. And I'm like, what the fuck? So the state's attorney pulls out his folder, and the photo that everyone sees of Gacy the clown waving, he has the original. And it's not blurry like everyone else. It's crisp. He has Gacy's like insurance forms, all this stuff. And he's like, I have this folder. I want to, I want to, I want to sell it to you because I can't give it to you. And I'm thinking I'm being set up. You know, this is where I'm being set up to buy, you know, like the commerce of it all. And I'm like, why can't we, why can't you give it to me? Why do you need money? You're a lawyer. He goes, listen, because I'm a lawyer, I'm going to need money. And I laugh and I go, I don't know. How's 50 bucks? He goes, perfect. But there has to be an exchange. And I really think I'm going to get arrested here. But I go for it. Put the 50 bucks on the table. He gives me the folder. And that was that. We went to Millennium Park in Chicago and he did an interview with me. And he gave me all this great compliments like, Shane, you're no different than um, the TV news or John Walsh from America's Most Wanted. You're the same thing. The only difference is they make a lot of money off it and you don't. And I was like, oh, that's great. That was great validation from the guy who put Gacy to fucking death. Like, you know, that was that was cool for him to say, you're a journalist, but just because you don't have a, a journalist degree does not mean that you're not telling a story about this. And I can't see anything you're doing that's exp that is promoting killing people. If that were the case, I wouldn't be talking to you. You know, you're, you're and he, he understood my view, like the prison lets this happen. He agreed with that. He's like, you're right. When you said that, all of us, you know, the state's attorneys and stuff was like, the kid's right. We shouldn't be letting this out. We could, we, some are liberals and some aren't. Some are like, well, they got to paint. And he's like, let them paint. Let them have art supplies, but don't let them sell it to the public. And so that was cool. That was cool. And then later on, Gacy's, Gacy's lawyer contacted me and wanted to sell me, all, after Gacy's death, wanted to sell me everything. And he had a masturbation box which was all oily and he'd open it up and had baby oil in it and all these, pu these pulp fiction books. And then he had Gacy's wallet that was on, like on the news with the receipts that he got caught for, like for the concrete and all this shit. And I put on <laughs> Gacy's jacket. I got a picture of me in Gacy's jacket. And at that point I got really sad and insecure. Cause I'm like the motherfucking jacket fits me like a charm. <laughs> I, I got the fucking piece of weight. Yeah. That's the ugliest laugh. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Oh, I love your laugh. Uh, oh my goodness, that's that's like like you hear like the bells of fate tolling or something putting on that jacket. Time oh, to go I'm so jerk off. off. <laughs> I'm walking up to the jacket. I'm like, that thing looks big. It's gonna be big on me. I put it on. I'm like, oh man, it fits perfect. Fuck, I gotta <laughs> get on some weight pills or something, diet pills. You know. <laughs> Do you think that your brush with owning up to the responsibilities of collaborating with Gacy were somewhat parallel with how you felt later on when you pulled Midas right I huh, that's... it it feels oddly similar to how you know it's something that hurt other people it's not as much of a responsibility because it seems like it affected mostly people of Chicago but I can't imagine Gacy really affecting outside of that area so much. Well, I would say, well, no, I don't think, I don't think that is true at all. I think when, when, when people who have had people murdered, mm -hmm. let alone by a serial killer, just one, like a single murder, they're triggered out by hearing about murders. And we're just in our culture in our day. Now we're understanding what triggers are, traumas, PTSD, but that wasn't a spoken topic when I was younger. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I think this this stuff hurts people in a deep way that have had murders happen in their life. It's a hard thing to get through when you've had someone murdered. Kind of being like uh, being reminded of your own mortality at a funeral, sort of that. Uh, well, being that reminded too, but... about someone 
being traumatized, someone lost. Yeah, that too. But yeah, but I think, you know, if someone had their a lover or a brother or sister horribly taken away from them before mm-hmm. their time by a murder, that shit gets triggering, I think. You know, yeah. for me, I, I quit doing serial killer stuff because I got so deep into it, I started to understand that. And that's my oh. walk through all of it has been an, uh, trying to understand things. And I don't have a problem understanding really dark shit. Mm-hmm. So I, I explore it to the point where it's almost like makes me crazy. Or I see, you know, like it really is like, holy fuck. I explore it until I feel it. You explored so that until the you tried on a jacket and it yeah. fit like a glove. <laughs> yeah, well, that, that was uh, something that I met with both lawyers and they both contacted me. And I was it was sort of neat because, you know, I'm a kid living in his car. I was I was living in my car before I started. So, to, you know, in Chicago. So as I climbed the ladder. That was sort of cool and successful, just like John Waters buying the book. Those are those are the moments that give you that validation we spoke about, I think, in season one. And um, and so, yeah, I think the concept is between might is right and that is that I explored it to the point that I felt it. Maybe I started with a joke. Maybe I started with these defense mechanisms like a joke or something like that and made light of it. And, and slowly got into it and slowly saw how it hurt people and slowly saw how people reacted to it and people I respected acted to it and our people I, I wanted to be like, you know, like smart, like, like, let's say a Frank Zapp. I don't know how he felt about serial killers, but people I admired would act about it. And they said it was hurtful. And then I, when I started to understand that, I backed away from it. But that was my exploration, because when I was younger, People thought I was going to turn out like that. So I was like wondering myself, am I going to turn out like this? <laughs> you know. Let's talk about Ed Gein's gravestone. Yeah. So how did you get in trouble with eBay with this one? Oh, well, eBay set the rules um, when I started selling grave, like the serial killer rules in Andy Khan. That's where we met. That's where we 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 started dating. Me and Andy Khan, um, <laughs> <laughs> is that I put up get grave dirt and they wanted to take it down. And I said, "Well, I'll sue you. I have every right to do this. You have no rules against grave dirt." And you know, so they fought it and made up a rule and then banned serial killer items across the board. It wasn't just grave dirt. But I started selling Gene grave dirt. I went up to visit I, in Wisconsin his grave, and eventually, eventually, I obtained his entire gravestone. And I would drive around Chicago with it for years as the third seat in my van, in my delivery van. And I would lift the cushion sometime and show people. And they're like, that's Ed Gein's fucking tombstone. I'm like, yeah. You Did know, you I was on Howard. the carpool lane with it? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I was on Howard Stern because of that and all this stuff. But like when we went up, okay, so, huh. I wonder how this works out as far as law goes. Meh. Fuck it. When we went up and took the stone, um, I was told that it's probably been done a ton of times when I came home with the stone. Um, the next morning it was international news and it was crazy. It was crazy. No one had ever done that. No one had ever t- taken green stone. So when I went up there to get the grave dirt, I looked around the, the, the yard, the, the uh, graveyard, and I saw this little old lady behind me putting flowers down on what I can only imagine is her husband or son's grave. I went over and looked at it. It was a man's name and it looked young. So I thought must be her son or nephew or cousin or someone's husband. And, um, she, and then there's, we go up to the Geenstone and there's beer cans all around it and cigarette butts and writings on it. Like it says, I masturbate to your picture every day and carved someone carved six, six, six in it. And so I looked at the stone and I looked back at the old lady putting flowers down and weeping. And I looked back at the stone and looked at her and I go, I'm doing everyone a favor. If I take this out of here, I take this to people who want to see it. And I take it away from people that are being irritated by all of us metal heads and freaks coming over here, pissing on his grave and whatever. And so fuck it. We, you know, I took it and that's that. You're like the Santa Claus of crime paraphernalia. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> or, uh, or Robin Hood, whatever. Took from the took from the graveyard and gave to the grave. Rob from Robin. the edge lords to give to the deserving fans. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. True exactly. Merch. And I eventually took it on tour, and the Seattle police confiscated it from me. 
so there's it it just went away well it, it get it got shipped it was great because the seattle police we had i had a square off and it was great it was videotape but they lost the video but the cops like you're take we're taking this stone i go no you're not and the cops like who are you I go that's my fucking stone you're not taking it anywhere they go this is a stolen stone we just got a word from wisconsin to pick it up and they show me the paper i go Look at that, because be, when we took it on tour, it was too heavy for us to lift, so I had to bring it to a grave place that made gravestones, and I had to have them cut the bottom half of it off so we could lift it, because it was like 1,500 pounds. That fucking thing was heavy. And when I when I took it, I brought two young kids up there with me, and they're like, we can't lift it. And I go, motherfuckers, we're up here, and you got to drove a car into the graveyard. We're here. We're lifting that fucking stone. We get this in there, and this guy's mom's like little fucking station wagons driving tilted like the whole almost the back end dragging <laughs> we're coming back with it it's very obvious we have something very heavy in the back of the station wagon his mom's station wagon how poetic and then in seattle i'm like you're not taking the stone and i say prove it and they bring up the picture and i go that picture's not the same as this stone and they start growling at me and i go you're not taking the stone you're not taking the stone over my body you're taking the stone i got this made by a hollywood prop maker this is a exaggerated piece of artwork prove me wrong there's no serial number on it and they go and they go get out of our way we're taking the stone and if you can prove it's yours you can fight to get it back and they took it they had to bring in other cops because those two couldn't lift it so they bring in former cops they take the stone away and it's sort of funny and <laughs> you wanted it so bad and you can't take it <laughs> yeah yeah and then then i call up the wisconsin person because and then i go on this tour angry white male tour and um we go to the bunny ranch and the owner of the bunny ranch this this uh brothel he, he hears this he knew about the story and was happy to meet me about that and he's like listen shane i want to give you the lawyers and the money to fight to get that stone back but i just want to make sure we get credit like the bunny ranch wear bunny ranch t-shirts on you know so he wanted it as a marketing thing and so we were working on this, and I call the, the police officer that was in charge of the police department in Plainfield, Wisconsin, and saying, hey, I'm, I want my stone back. He's like, what are you talking about? I go, I want my Ed Gein stone back. That's mine. And he goes, you son of a bitch. You come up here and get it. And he hangs up the phone. <laughs> you know, I tell him, I go, you can't prove that's yours. There's no serial number on it. He calls me a son of a bitch and hangs up. And the uh, Bunny Ranch, we never, they never followed through with the lawyers and all that stuff, so... It's in Wisconsin somewhere, and I hear it's in, like, their history museum now. So if that's not there, the actual place of Gein is unmarked. Yes, but his family markers are next to it. Okay, can... so it's something people, diehard fans, can go in their skin suits and visit if they wanted to. Oh, yeah, and okay. I got to bring Ed Gein's tour uh, truck we, we had Ed Gein's truck come to Salem, Massachusetts for the True Crime Warp Mine Tour. And that was interesting because that gentleman had Ed Gein's truck and then took me to the last place Gein was, the store. Like it was a farmhouse they had for, they would sell farm supplies like nails and shit like that. And we went in the store and the guy's like, it hasn't been open since they arrested Gein. My parents shut it down and I've never opened it. So we went in there, it was all dusty and had the original newspapers in there. It was really neat. I got all this tour of Gein's place. I, I think I got a teapot from him, from from the gentleman that he said it was Ed Gein's teapot. I've since lost it. Um, but it was a really, you know, I, I got shown around the Plainfield area by locals, and it was sort of neat. And if you look up on archive.org, you'll find true crime. Uh, I, I don't know. There's a true crime podcast I have up there. Crime and Cookies, I think it's called. And I have interviews with people that are family members that were murdered by Gein and all that stuff. There's like, it's like the days of our lives theme, but it's like the days of Plainfield's lives. Do, 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 do. You know, Aww. it's old soap. It's like a soap opera and they're yelling at each other. I don't know if I'm making sense at this point. Um, the it's Gein interesting stuff. that you would have taken the gravestone and toured around with it considering Gein was known as a grave robber. And yeah, taken corpses. It's this is this is all quite an interesting way to treat him. <laughs> That's how I saw it too. I was like, "Fuck this guy! He's a grave robber. I could take a stone. He had no respect, and I'm going to do it." Like he wouldn't. 
he would probably laugh at me having no respect. I don't know. Maybe he wouldn't, but fuck him. You know, I'm going to take the stone. I mean, some of the graves he robbed were right next to his. <laughs> he, um, he's an interesting one too, how he, he's sort of like a dual, not duality, uh, like an adversary to Dorothea Puente where, and I'm not trying to make light of any victims and I'm not trying to make light of, crime but the way that puente mostly had male victims you know all these female body parts that were found in gein's house how what he did to women and it's interesting that you know he had his mother was kind of an overshadowing person of his life and dorothea puente was treated very poorly by men throughout her life and it's it's quite an interesting evil yin and yang going on there. Yeah, and remember, Gein would sew these women's bodies together and wear the suit. Yes. In the full moon. So he, I almost feel like he was a woman trapped in a man's body. Like this is before any of uh, uh, transitioning was acceptable. He was maybe a person like that. Maybe was, you know, had some maybe sexual. Maybe had body dysmorphia. Or there you go. Like that. I, I don't know. I understand yeah. that a little bit, but it's when you you don't feel right in what you are, and um, you you are unhappy with, or just even repulsed at some points with what I you see. are because you don't feel like you are in the right body. I, I see, and I that I would see. I see a sexuality in all male serial killers, like there's a sexual perversity. Yes, there's there's a fetish within his, and it's been imitated by a lot of artists as well. You know the way, or if not not a fetish, an exploration on some sort of abuse. Like I've I've read of serial killer that was collecting feet, and it was because his mom made him rub the rub his rub her feet, and she would then masturbate while he was rubbing his feet. So he was exploring his own issues, like what it was his trauma going on through serial killing. And I think there's there's these sexual abuse or sexual tie-ins to men often, often. I, I feel like the parts that were made into things, um, they're, it's like the head, the torso, and the legs that were what Gein was into, I believe. Yeah. And it... It kind of makes me wonder what the extent of the abuse from his mother was and or perhaps his obsessions with parts that he wasn't satisfied with on his own. But um, sticking out of one thing, one thing uh-huh. as the sheriff, as the sheriff who went in the house first said, Ed Gein had the finest collection of nipples I've ever seen. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> oh, There is an episode of Aqua Teen Hunger Force where these uh, magical sirens talk Carl into cutting off his nipples and serving the sirens like grapes, which they reject him. So the Markula, the Dracula-like landlord of Carl and the Aqua Teens, shows up and finds the nipples and says, Finally, nipples of my very own! (laughs) And that's all I can think of right now. (laughs) <laughs> oh God! And now, now you trigger me. I know a guy who burned his nipples off, and this guy's like the smartest fuck. He's like an astrophysicist. He's like fucking smart and cool, and I really love the guy. But he burned his nipples off when he had a drug and alcohol problem, and I was like, and he, I saw him. I was like, fuck, dude. Oh, like, no. Nipples are my one one of my top pleasures. You know? <laughs> <laughs> so now. I actually would like to kind of circle back to Dorothea Puente and what I was kind of teasing earlier about drawing connections. And I wanted to talk a little bit about the female narcissist and covert narcissism. Because on one hand, you would mention about Dorothea Puente was a narcissist. And I see that Ed Gein was definitely the strings were pulled on him by a narcissist as well. And he was a victim of someone else's narcissism. I'm not calling Ed Gein a a victim, by the way, I'm just saying. And um, 
I was curious. We've talked a little bit off off the air about female narcissism, covert narcissism. Did you ever draw any sort of personal connection to the experiences or even the egos of these killers to people you knew? Oh, absolutely. Um, for Thea and my my cert, like my um, study of male serial killers were re- was related to myself and understanding things that were said to me at a young age. Mm-hmm. But my exploration of female serial killers were because they reminded me of my mother. And of and of un, uh, unfo- you know un- unfortunately every girl I've dated since my mother you know since I dated my mother I'm joking I've never dated my mother but since I left home you know any woman I've dated has been very similar to my mother and um, now that won't happen again I'm definitely going to be cautious uh, the next round but yeah absolutely was this I and that's something I'm working out in counseling now is. Like definitely that was that, but it was also like me working with Thea was me trying to save my mother, me working with me, me befriending a stripper or, and I'm not putting down all strippers, but a narcissist that happened to be a stripper, me trying to help them or work with them or do something nice for them was me trying to save my mother. The girls I dated, I was very attracted to because they were like my mother, I guess, but it was also, I was trying to save them. I was trying to help them. So my I was obsessed with helping them, doing things for them, try, just as I did for my mom. I raised my brothers. My brothers would say, oh, you're the, you are a mom and fa- dad because I had to stay home and watch them all the time and stuff like that. So it was like I just was trying to help these. I understand that now. I don't understand it at the point when you're doing it. But that's that's what I could say. And the same with Thea. Like, it just reminds me of my mother. Yeah. Gacy was, um, he was always looking to impress his father and be closer to his father. And I hear you mention a lot about your mother, but did you see a little of yourself in Gacy as well? Well, I saw a little of myself in the life of serial killers when I started reading about them. They were Mm -hmm. all abused. And yeah, there was a lot of similarities. So when people would say those mean things to me, I definitely would see sometimes, well, uh, some of Gacy and me, I I don't think so. Okay. But I, 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 but I should say I saw my father in some of these people or I related with Gacy's abuse with his father beating on him. So I saw that part of it, much like I see in Donald Trump or Republicans. They are the father figures and the de- Democrats are the mother figures. So m- much the trauma I get from Trump a lot of times is that he reminds me of my bully idiot father. And uh, so Gacy went through that. So I had a sympathy. I had a bonding with a mon- men- oh. I, But I had Frank Zapp in my life at a younger age where he's like basically saying, you know, someone could blow their brains off to heavy metal, but millions of people are listening to heavy metal and not blowing their brains off. So that person was crazy. And so that's how I was able to rationalize like, well, yeah, I was beaten and they were beaten, but millions of kids are beaten and not all of us turn out to be serial killers. So that's not my fate. That's unfortunate, their fate. You know, I think that's... that a lot of those people too, unfortunately, were going to do something regardless of their environment. Well, I interviewed, um, I forget her name now, Helen Morrison. She uh-huh. has Gacy's brain in her basement. And I think her, and I have that interview on archive.org, um, I think her opinion of that was that it's, it's uh, you know, you hurt, so you murder someone and there's a sexual fetish or fantasy going on there, a sadist, sadistic need. And then once you do it, it becomes a drug addiction, ad- addiction. like you have to keep doing it, you have to one-up it. A form of gratification. It. Yeah. And so she saw it as something like that, but maybe it's similar to what you're saying too, like, you know, but... There's not one thing that makes a serial killer. It's a definitely an anomaly, like an an amazing. Uh, not I don't I don't mean in a positive way, but it's just a uh, holy shit. You can't really. Ex- everyone tries to explain it, the and there's not storm, right? Yeah, it's the perfect storm. It's genetics. It's all of the above. It's like holy shit, you know. But but again, the Frank Zappa logic is there's a lot of people who go through that perfect storm and survive. So that's where our question mark comes up. You know, that's. I could rel- I could have a checkoff box. That happened to Gacy. Check me too. Check. I could check all those boxes, but I have never had the need to want to serial kill people, and I've never, 
I would be, I would say I'm probably only 20% sadist <laughs> or maybe 30% on a good day or bad day. I should a bad day. I, I'm not really sadistic like that. So I, I don't understand that with, that's not in my character. And so uh, I could hurt someone in a momentary thing if they like uh, for protection and probably when I was younger, when I was really angry and still carried my father's rage, I could have hurt someone, you know, it put them in the grave. But that's not within my character. I feel bad when I hurt people. I don't ever feel good. Sadists feel good. They get off on it. You know, it makes me wilt. Speaking of sadists, the last one I wanted to ask you a little bit about was Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker. Oh, yeah. That, me and Richard were tight. <laughs> so... How did you speak to him? Oh, well, through mail. I got mm -hmm. a couple calls from him, but basically it's all through mail. The calls are really hard and limited, and especially for Richard. They, he was in West Coast, and he, had, he didn't have a lot. But So Richard, shit, Richard is the one who gave me the phone number to LeVay. And it happened to be to Carla, uh, not, I mean, uh, Zena LeVay. And so that was funny. And, and so I, I reached out to Zena, and, and then found out they had parted and so but Richard liked Asian porn he's like send me Asian porn you know that was our barter and that's what he liked and uh foot I think he had a foot fetish and panty fetish and he would explain that like foot fetish this 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 and then um Richard was a poet he was like an artist and again he was a he, he carried I think we spoke about this before maybe but maybe not he carried the trauma of his uncle from Vietnam. And that's why he would sneak in windows because his uncle would tell him about sneaking in win windows and raping the Vietnamese and killing them. And he, a lot would, of his victims were Vietnamese. Right. That's exactly it. And his uncle would tell him these stories when he was a kid. His uncle would get high and drunk and just have a PTSD moment. Like, you know, like, oh, I did this. And Richard was there looking up to his uncle and Richard enacted that stuff. He wanted to explore it. And he did on a cold night, on a cold LA night, he would write this poetic lines in his letters to me. And I was just like, man, this, you know, he was, he, Richard was a special guy to me because he was honest. He, he was never repentant about, he never, he never like, I blame it on my mother. I blame it on this. I was drunk. I wasn't there. I'm crazy. He was like, no, I did it. And I liked it. And I'll do it again when I get out of here, you know? He enjoyed. He's an, he's an anomaly compared to these other killers because he's a lone wolf, and right. he's, you know, people. The media called him a Satanist, and said he claimed he was one. Was he one? Well, he he claimed it. I, I mean, yeah. I, I I don't know. He was more of a, I would say, a Satanist in the realm of people who believe in Satan or God. Yes, you know, he most was Satanists, the boogeyman. Right, most Satanists are atheistic or agnostic in a, a scientific way. I think he got uh -huh. off on being menacing, and that made him more menacing. But, I mean, he wrote a fucking pentagram on his hand. You know, that's a famous photo of him, and yes. he holds it up in court. So, yeah, you know, that's that was, uh, for all the metalheads, his ACDC stuff and all that stuff was, and I, I don't, you know, it was sort of cool. And I was a young guy, though. I, I mean, I get, I get how, I get, I get it, and I don't mean to, make less of what he did, but I have to tell you how I honestly saw it as a kid. You know, he's flashing a pentagram and he's talking about ACDC and as a kid that is a metalhead and I, re I was like, wow, I, I relate with this guy, you know? I'm angry too. And I, yeah. But do you think that also it it was all to call yourself, market yourself as a Satanist, draw this pentagram on your hand, be publicized like that, it's it's feeding a sociopath's ego a little too. You know, I, I think of how Charles Manson put the swastika on his forehead and then all the girls did it. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of the same thing. Here's my chance, you know, hit it. Wow. That is great. That's a great, it's performance art to him. Yeah. Another great observation that I've not, I've not thought of like that. You know, I, I can only tell you, I'm I'm looking at it in in a personal way, in a in an mm -hmm. artistic way. My life I see as a piece of art. Like when I think about this stuff, 
I'm like, wow, that was an exploration. That was an exploration. That was me exploring something and trying to figure out, oh, that was me exploiting something. And, it, you know, I was either exploiting or exploring <laughs> and sometimes both. And so Richard was another exploration in the dark side and how, wow, this guy admits it. This guy likes it. This guy's a sadist. What is that? What's going on here? You know, and, and I had been in jail when I first heard about Satanism, I was in jail in a county jail next to the Chicago Rippers. I took the the jail bus to the to court with, and one of the Chicago Rippers had his court case in front of mine. So I, we'd have to sit through court and listen to his satanic rituals. And then well, I was handcuffed to him in the paddy wagon and he would talk about Satanism He's, and tell me about it. And uh, that's where I first heard about it. And then I looked at, you know, like, but he would cut off women's boobs and put them in the freezer and do rituals, him and his friends. Uh, prostitutes, women, you know, but not putting a prostitute down at all. But, you know, most but of the... But if most the, the victims mo were all chefs, then you would say chefs. So if right. they were all prostitutes, they were all prostitutes, or mostly I, prostitutes. Well, I illustrate that as well to say, like, most victims of serial killers are people who are invisible to society, so they can get away with it. They Gacy moved up the ladder to kill a Boy Scout because he wanted to get caught. His basement was full. He was he was he wanted to get caught. He went to a neighbor Boy Scout, you know, and he got caught because of that. Had he just kept trolling gay hookers, he probably would have got away with it to this day. Because they, they were there's quite an invis invisible at his time. Right, right, and so that's the same. That's all. That's the only reason I mentioned they were prostitutes. And also, so the Asian women are somewhat just to sorry to cut you off, but Asian women are somewhat invisible victims even to this day. Um, think of the last time you heard about an Asian victim, but they do exist. Yeah, people of color all around are yes. pretty invisible victims. You're you're right. That's um so that's un something we're dealing. Unfortunately, uh, Richard Ramirez could get away with it still. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I. It's you know I, the one thing I think is a saving type of deal is um, cameras everywhere. So it's it's a lot harder tracking. Everything's a tracking device. It's a I, I don't I don't know if we'll see serial killers so much anymore. We see mass shooters, you know, going to WalMarts and stuff like that. That's what that's what that's grown into. It grew into that. That's sort of a combination between school shooters and serial killers. Is the mass shooter the guy who goes out in public and uh, kills a lot of people like the guy in Vegas who killed 300 people. Right. Like that guy was a serial killer that knew he couldn't get away with it. Probably is too public. He didn't, he couldn't understand how he could get away with it. He didn't want, you know, and it built up. And I think there was something in him that he, like you're saying, wanted to explore death. This it, you know, there was a sadism in him that couldn't be quenched or was never explored. Mm -hmm. Um, I did want to mention quickly um, the Cecil Hotel in downtown L.A. where Richard Ramirez primarily was going back to and living at when he was killing women in Los Angeles. I just wanted to quickly mention an incident that had happened um, in like uh, maybe like five, six years ago. There was actually a uh, Chinese Chinese Canadian girl who was mur who died in that hotel. They don't know if she was murdered or what happened, but her body was floating in the water tank. And they only found her after guests were complaining that there was a weird smell and the water was gross. And there was plenty of surveillance showing her wandering around, going in and out of the elevator. And a lot of people seem to blame it on drugs, but she was really spooked about something. And I think something else happened to her because a lot of it became a strange tourist attraction for some uh, Chinese tourists from like even from mainland China to go to L.A., go to the same hotel and go t sneak over to the water tank and see how easy it is to get in and out of it. And so they have it's been proven and you can find on YouTube as well about the water tank test that you can get out of it. So I think something may may have happened to her as well in this hotel. But um I remember that story happening. Mm -hmm. I, I I remember hearing it was a suicide or drug, you know, all the weird I didn't follow it so But I can't help but feel like she may have been a victim only because it's easy to rule something off as a suicide and That's what they do. 
and so it, it just an interesting modern segue into you know this this was an asian victim and this is where ramirez lived it's a it's kind of scary that she died where he was living kind of thing you know unfortunate yeah yeah for sure but you know it's it, our society is getting less and less invisible and so it's harder and harder to pick on people of of uh less privilege mm -hmm. and 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 as we see with people filming police shootings all the time and the outrage from all people of heart when they see these abuses by police officers and stuff they're you know it's it's an outrage to i the think general that, public yeah. and society in general it's an outrage and so when when we become more and less and less that, that those things are becoming less and less invisible and so right and good Absolutely. And I think that the invisibility started going away and people's, you know, people suffering and like, you know, heinous crimes that shouldn't have happened from lawmen and other people who should have been trusted. That didn't start until maybe like 2015. It started to get a little more apparent of like, you know, recording the police doing something wrong. And, you know, to be fair, this this girl died in 2013. So I think that these crimes do add up to more security in pre protecting the people, whether it's a serial killer, shooter, corrupt person. All righty. So segging away from my virtue signal, I do want <laughs> to know here in 2019, soon to be 2020, if you're listening to this in 2020, which is going to be our year. Yeah, that's um, right. As the so prophetic just... liar, I'm telling you this. Um, <laughs> so here in 20, 2019, 2020, how do you see serial killers in retrospect as, as now, Shane? Well, I stay away from news like that because I've studied it so much, it scarred me. Mm -hmm. You know, I really dive deep in the subjects that I deal with. So I, I, I dove pretty deep in that. You know, I dealt with Manson, everyone, Manson's family. I dealt with these people and um, have met murderers, hung out with people like that. It's just something that at this point, I don't watch any of the films. I know all about it. So it just becomes boring to me. Not boring, but... It's it's traumatic because, like I said, I figured it out in the point where I felt it. And when I felt it, it did not give me pleasure. It gave me pain. And I'm not into pain, pain, pain pained up. And so I, I think I don't I think serial killers are evolving into mass shooters. And that seems like much like the school shooter before the school shooter it was mass suicide. Where in my when I was younger, 16, a kid would kill themselves in school and then five other kids in that school would kill themselves. And then that would hit the paper and the school next to them, a kid would kill themselves and 10 kids would, you know, so it was like this suicide epidemic. And then that grew into the school shooter epidemic. And now we have these mass shooters that are sort of a combination of serial killer school shooter, you know, where they're, so that's how I see that. Like it's, it's, and there's something, there's a problem you know, and it's hard to balance this with the Frank Zappa logic. There's millions of people not acting out like this. But there is something that that is an expression. And when people talk about art as an expression, I don't necessarily agree with that. But if we're going to go on that re context, like art's an expression, then so is serial killing and so is mass shooting. And what are they expressing? And that's never explored. Like even with the Columbine kids, a lot of the evidence was suppressed and hidden. Um, and so it's like, what are they expressing? Where is that coming from? Are they abused children? Like we know about, about serial killers. Are they from a socioeconomic background that, that is painful? Are they rich kids? Are they rich, privileged and boring people who are doing these mass shootings? Which it sort of seems like they're upper middle class. Now I haven't studied this stuff, but it sort of seems like the mass shooters are, are like the serial killers, sort of like middle class white guys where they and i think it's like the kind i've heard this concept tossed around about mass shooters is is it's a lot of middle class white guys who are not getting what they're promised anymore they were promised privilege and elite status and now there's women in power and people of color in power and, and everyone's got to share the space and they're not they're not getting anywhere they're like losing their jobs they're they're you know there's 
and they're just frustrated. They're, they're, I think there's a concept to that that I, I haven't explored totally, but I sort of agree with it, where it's like, I was born white and privileged. Why is that not working out in my 40s or my 30s? Your Why father are these... and the gold watch. Right, right, exactly. Why do these people have it better than me? They're supposed to be below me. That's what these 40 and 50-year-olds were taught. Like, hey, 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 brother, you're supposed to be below me. You're supposed to be cleaning my car, but I'm cleaning your car. And then they go out and mass shoot things. I don't know. I don't know about that theory, but it sounds pretty good. <laughs> it's a good theory, but then you have the little shits like the one in Gilroy who are too young to know that hierarchy, except for hearing what their father tells them, perhaps, or just the echo chamber. You have also the echo chamber of the internet, also, that's breeding a lot of very unfortunate beliefs as well that, you know. Yeah people who don't know better are eating up well let me make it clear i don't think that any most anything is done for one reason i think we have a, a very we are a very complex being our a human species mm -hmm. so we are motivated by many things we understand and many things we don't understand and so i think there's a sexuality component attached to everyone that's murdering like a frustrated sexuality you know perhaps a, su a suppressed sexuality it seems um and I'm not really sure about like the Gilroy person that we spoke of. That person made no sense, especially when they put up Might is Right. I, I still don't understand how Might is Right has to do with uh, murdering a bunch of people that are in a rich neighborhood and where you live as a privileged kid and <laughs> killing yourself. And, you know, that whole thing is about survival. It's like the subtitle survival of the fittest. So I don't never under I didn't understand that part of it. And I don't understand that crime. That I, is like a representation of another example of zealotry, sort of in the same way, I think, as someone who swears by the Bible, but then they go and murder people at an abortion clinic. Right, or but then they get the... But then you got the Frank Zappa logic, like there's a lot of people who are zealots that don't go kill. So what made this yes. person do it? What was it? What was the Gilroy shooter? Where is it? How can we find that? And that's where... You know, I have ceased to look into it because it's a really hard thing. Was that kid not seen by his parents? Was he not hugged as a baby? What the fuck happened? You know, and I'm not, of course, a psychologist. And and, and, and I, my psychologist uh, is, is into serial killer study. And she <laughs> she she's done this for years, too. And she was agree with she agrees with me. And I agree with her that we can't figure it out. It's an, it's just like, holy shit, that's fucking fucked up. And I wouldn't do that. And why are they doing that? And she can't figure it out. And she's a professional. I can't figure it out. And I would could say, and she has said, you are like a professional to me because I've studied it more than her. So I, I, I don't know. I wish, <laughs> I wish we had those answers. I wish, I, you know, I, you want to think your politics will save people. Like I'm a Bernie Sanders fan. So I want to think that those politics will save people and make them better and not hurt people. But I just don't know, you know, I just don't know. Maybe over pop. I don't know. It's such a weird thing. It's such a sad thing. I think the mystery continues the conversation. And while you might be finished with, you know, work with serial killers, there will be another Shane down the road who may do the same thing. Maybe about the school shooters, maybe about the mass shooters. And uh. it, It'll just continue to pass on, I think. I had a whole book written about school shooters called Jihad USA. It was lost in a storage area that was stolen. Um, long story short, but but there were so many theories in there that were good. I'm sorry, it triggered me out to think of that if I'm going off on. Oh, that's a good was, going off because I do um, plan to release also an episode this season regarding... Columbine and oh, the Columbine great. Diaries as well. So this is up. a fantastic tease for what's to come season three. Excellent. I've got some stuff to say. Yeah. I, I won't say it now, though. We gotta good, because we're done. <laughs> oh, good. Are we not recording anymore? Can I give the occult secrets? Yes, you can give all the occult secrets. Now, now. we're trading secrets. You know how that goes. We trade occult secrets. Thank you for listening subscribe and tune into our next episode wherever you prefer to listen to podcasts you can find
find us at Speak of the Devil Pod on Twitter and contact us at Speak of the Devil Pod at gmail.com. For Shane's artwork or to support his endeavors, please visit shanebugby.com or find him on Twitter at shanebugby. I've been Nanarol. Have a good one. Oh, and Shane is the devil.com.